Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to a review. Oh, there's Matthew right there. Perfect. So, you can probably slide over a little bit, Marcus. Just because I'm going to bite you there. There's a space right beside this. Let's just. Uh, Magnus, would you mind opening in prayer this morning, please? All right. Lord, thank you for this uh, space that we have to worship and praise you in. Um, and thank you for keeping us safe through all of this. And I would hope that you keep the, the camp safe. And if it's your will. In your name, so, welcome to the revised view of uh, what we're doing. Uh, for those of you who were here uh, for last month, and I suppose we could deal with all of us, uh, there was one verse that really stood out to me when we were going through the Old Testament. It was very strange at the time. Uh, it came from the book of Esther, when we were studying the book of Esther. And Mordecai told Esther that she was put there in those particular circumstances for such a time as this. Do you remember in Esther chapter 4, verse 14, if you're taking notes? Um, and that's the sort of the verse that, that really stood out to me. And uh, I think as we go through the this this video on that Jake's going to do and then what I'm going to share on it a little bit uh, may help us to understand a little bit about uh, God working in our lives despite ourselves and our limited understanding of what's going on. Um, Angus tells this, Angus Aiken tells this story Oh, he, he was taking a hockey team to play in 100 Mile House. And the roads were horrible, uh, so horrible that some wives wouldn't let their husbands go on the trip. Uh, and, and as he goes along, they get stopped on the middle of the highway between Kamloops and Cache Creek. And the road's just so bad that uh, everything stopped. Now the kids went to play hockey. And they're in this lineup that's sort of reminiscent to being in Los Angeles during a traffic jam. And you just, you know that this, once it, we went to preach in a, a, an assembly there, it was only 12 miles away from us. The first 10 miles took 10 minutes. The last two miles took an hour and a half. Um, and it was just wasn't going. Uh, and it's a good thing I thought, well, we'll when we get close, we'll stop at a restaurant and eat. We didn't get to eat, but that's okay because they had food prepared for us after the meal, uh, something called papusas, which is an El Salvadoran treat that you should all try uh, before you die because I'm not sure you'll get it in heaven or not. Um, but uh, so they had this long line. And the kids were going to 100 Mile House to do what? Play hockey. What did they want to do? Play hockey. So they're stopped. There's no traffic coming or going. So you know what the kids did? They got out of the bus and they played hockey on the highway. They knew what they were supposed to do. They knew what they wanted to do. They weren't where they sort of figured they should be, but it didn't matter to them that they weren't where they figured they should be. They wanted to play hockey, so it doesn't matter if it's in the driveway, the front yard, in the middle of, of highway number one. How many people can say they played hockey in the middle of highway one, the Trans-Canada Highway, for an hour? Who can say that? Only those kids. And so the point is we're not quite where we thought we'd be. But we came up here as part of a discipleship program, 
Um, we're praying about, we're thinking about. There's no decisions made absolutely whatsoever. But maybe we can do a VBS here. We're praying about it. Something you can pray with us. It wouldn't happen this week, but awesome. It would be a lot different. We just switch it around. Um, and I told Cody the story this morning. In Mexico, we used to do day VBSs with six, seven, eight hundred kids. And uh, we did it. So it's not an impossible thing to do at a chapel building. <coughs> so it is possible. So we're praying about that. Um, but for such a time as this, we're all here together. We, we had the rest of the month basically booked off to serve the Lord anyways. Uh, there's no sense to jump ship before you have to actually get into a lifeboat and leave. Uh, the Lord has us here for such a time as this. Um, I don't know how it went in Caleb's house or Anna's house last. Um, I was thinking actually more of this morning rather than last night. Uh, I was thinking... I'm going to have to go to Costco and buy a, a few flats of eggs and a few loaves of bread to drop off at their houses because they were probably thinking there's enough room for everybody to sleep, but they probably never thought about one bathroom and all those people. Was that a problem this morning? No. No? And they probably never thought that I need a really big pan to cook stuff in. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, those were two of my thoughts. But despite that, um, we're spending time together. And uh, so be encouraged. The Lord is still sitting on the throne of heaven. And he's still guiding the affairs of this world, uh, despite what it appears to be. And that's sort of where we we're at with this uh intertestamental period um, they weren't quite sure what God was doing so let's watch this video and then I'm going to share curse that's the last word in the Old Testament and it hangs there like a death knell on almost 4,000 years of human history all through that time God graciously spoke to the but at the end of Malachi, God signed off to the promise that he would send his son of righteousness to flood this dark world with gospel light. Then, 400 years of silence from heaven. Now, people don't mind ignoring God, but they don't like being ignored by them. So the Jews kept writing books, books we call the Apocrypha. But it was evident to thinking Jews that they couldn't compare with the canon of scriptures, so they weren't included in the Hebrew Bible. It was during these 400 years, however, that some key developments occurred. The Old Testament was translated in Egypt from Hebrew into Greek, called the Septuagint. It's a flawed translation, but it does provide a helpful guide to the Greek equivalents for Hebrew words. Also during that period, we see the rise of rabbinical schools like the Sadducees, Pharisees, and Essenes, who copied the Dead Sea Scrolls during this time. As well, there was the development of the synagogue system where Jews would gather to discuss the Bible. Historians claim that the first hundred years of God's silence as the highest point of man's intellectual achievement. This was the age of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Alexander the Great exported Greek ideas across the ancient world. And although the Romans militarily defeated the Greeks, culturally, the Greeks dominated the world of the New Testament. So God had everything ready for the coming of his son, the rebuilt city of Jerusalem, out of the rubble of Babylonian destruction. Pax Romana, relative stability and peace throughout the Roman Empire. The common use of the Greek language, with all its subtle distinctions, ideal for explaining New Testament doctrine. An unrivaled road system to aid the believers as they spread the gospel across the empire. The synagogues in cities dotting the Roman world where monotheistic Jews gathered interested in discussing the scriptures. Plus, a heightened anticipation in Israel 
for the coming Messiah. And at just the right time, the Lord Jesus arrived on planet Earth. And that's a scripture snapshot of the intertestament period. Comments, questions? We don't have the books yet, so hopefully someone's going to be able to get into camp again and do some things. Um, anybody know what the very last word of the Old Testament is? Utter destruction or curse? Curse. Um, <laughs> Who would like that to be God's last word to you? Because a lot of people are going to hear that. That's their very last thing they're going to hear. They might not hear exactly the word curse, but they're going to hear, depart from me, worker of iniquity. Which sounds awfully similar to a curse to me. Doesn't it? So if you were hearing those words, uh, what would you want? Someone said that to you, Jessica. Just get lost. Get out of here. Get out of my sight. What would I say? And it's somebody you just thought the world of and they said adios because he was a Mexican <laughs> <laughs> sayonara because he was Japanese so. <laughs> I'll be the same because he was German <laughs> yeah well what would if that was somebody's last <laughs> words to you and then if you had that question, what did I do? Or what happened? Uh, Ian, what would, what would, if you had that question, what would I do? What happened? Uh, you had all these thousand questions bubbling up and boiling in your mind. Then what? If you someone said scram and you had all these questions, what did I do? Because you that person apparently cared for you, and then they said, I'm out of here. And you had all these questions that Jessica had bubbling in your mind. What happened? What went wrong? What would what would you like to know next? What was the main cause? Of it. Yeah, and that's what Jessica said. But after you had those questions, what would you want to happen? How can I fix it? How can I fix it? And how would you figure out how to fix it? Well, they're gone. <laughs> well, maybe they have a cell phone. What might you do? And then you do what? Now you got them on the line, or her on the line, depending on who you are. Now what? What went wrong? That's that's perfectly logical. Doesn't that sound logical? What Marissa saying? Like, I don't get it. What went wrong? And so the last words of God is curse. And then 400 years, but apparently they're not answering their phone call. And, and God wasn't apparently doing anything. But was God doing anything during those 400 years? So in, in Jewish style, a Jewish wedding, there would be 
sort of a ceremony that would announce the engagement. And then the, the groom-to-be would go back to his father's house. And what would he do at his father's house, according to John chapter 14? Getting his uh, department ready. Go, I'm going to prepare a place for you. you. Who's Jesus talking about? The bride, right? Okay, where has got my ring. Da -da -da, da -da -da, look at everybody. And it's a Jewish wedding, so they had a Jewish jeweler, and Jewish jewelers have these big rings. I don't know how many Jewish brides you know, but uh, it's kind of embarrassing, I guess, uh, what I gave to Leo, but uh, that's besides the point. <laughs> Don't tell her that. And never let her know any Jewish. Have you ever seen like Bridezilla? And they have this like baseball on their finger. <coughs> and then they're, they're like, this flower has a wilt in this corner and it's not acceptable. Take it all back. But well, that's besides the point. Wow. <laughs> and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And then. How long does it take to build a house? Tell me in exact hours. I don't know. Can I ask Josh, how long does it take to get the permits? Two years. No, I want exact hours. So we know the time. We, we don't know. That's why Jesus left and he's preparing a place for when's he coming back? Because that's what he promised. If I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to return so I can receive you to myself. So is Jesus in heaven doing absolutely nothing right now? Was God in heaven doing absolutely nothing during those 400 years? And that's the whole point. Remember that verse from Esther. I don't know why it stood out when I was preaching it, but it almost made me cry. For such a time as the whole of history has brought you to this place for such a time as this. The fire's happening for such a time as this. Bula Lake happened for such a time as this. They bought the chapel years ago for such a time as this. Everybody got a little bit, uh, their hands were rubbing together in April and May and June for such a time as this when you were signing up. Everything in your lives has prepared you for this moment in history, in your history. And God is doing all these things to work together for good in our history. Personally. Now, in those 400 years, Jade mentioned a bunch of things that God was doing when he appeared to be silent. So, the Pax Romana, who remembers what Pax Romana means? Roman peace. Roman peace. Um, there was relative stability in the Roman Empire. Now, if you look in the history books, you have to just draw a distinction between the kingdom of Rome which was the city, and the Roman Empire. The city of Rome during those, when it was a kingdom, was always battling. But now we're talking about the Roman Empire under the Caesars. And the empire had relative stability. Now what does stability bring? What does stability allow? Development. Development. What else? What if you're traveling down in here? You're in Jerusalem worshiping and you decided you wanted to go home to Jericho. And you're going down to Jericho. What might happen if there's no stability as you're going down to Jericho? You might be wrong. You might get. Robbed. You might get killed. You might get killed. You might get 
get almost killed and left for dead. I think there's a story about that in the Bible. <laughs> so with the soldiers everywhere, it was very hard. It happened, but it, was, it wasn't a common thing. Stability. Uh, the Romans built roads. And the foundations of those roads and the roots of those roads are still there today, 2,000 years later. Oh, it's paved, and you can, it's a little bit wider than it used to be. But where they surveyed those roads and where they put those bridges is where the roads and bridges are today. Don't you find that kind of amazing that something done 2,000 years ago, uh, you know, it's not a, a rock road. It's not a dirt road anymore. But the highways through Europe were surveyed by the Romans 2,000 years. 500 years ago, that's how good they were. Um, uh, Jay had mentioned it. Uh, there was a Hellenization. That means everything turned to Greek culture. So even when Rome was ruling, what language was there? Greek. That was the international business language. If you wanted to do business, even in the Roman Empire, you had to speak. Greek. Today, if you want to do business in the world, what language do you need to speak? English. English. A hundred years ago, what language did you need to speak? English. Spanish. French. <laughs> Close. Um, and I'm not a prophet or anything, but if you want to do business in 50 years, what language are you going to need to speak? Chinese. 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 <laughs> Mandarin in particular. Um, I'm not a prophet. I don't know that that's going to happen or not. Uh, it, it's that culture dominated. There was an idea of democracy. What does democracy mean? The will of the people or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're governed by the people, right? The people's choice. Um, that's still around today, and Josh knows that because he studied the statues in Daniel. And he saw that it went from valuable soft gold in the head to strong iron in the feet, but iron was worth. Who's ever heard of anybody investing in iron? I'm going to go to the bank and buy a few bars of iron. The only one who buy iron are welders. It's, and, and democracy is, is still around. Um, the language is around. If you want to communicate something, is it good that there's a way, way to transport things efficiently because there's peace, whether it's by road or by boat? So if you want to take a message around the world, is it better to have one language that most people speak? And if the business people hear it, they'll share it with other people in their own language. I think when Paul talks about having tongues more than any man in the book of Acts, that's for evangelism. It's not for worship. It's not for making a show. If you're a missionary evangelist and you're going into uh, Greece, wouldn't it be nice to know Greek? Yeah. Um, in the days of Jesus... Uh, wouldn't it be nice to go to Egypt and speak Egyptian? There is no Egyptian today. It's all Arabic. The Muslims changed it and destroyed it. They keep on destroying history after history after history. There is no Egyptian today. There is no Iranian today. There is no Lebanese today. Oh, well, there's a little bit of Lebanese, but it's not very good Lebanese. There's no Libyan today. There's no... You see, they destroyed all these. But in those days, people spoke Egyptian. Wouldn't it be nice to speak Egyptian if you're going to go to Egypt? Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice to speak Miletan when you went to Miletus? Wouldn't it be nice to speak Cretan when you went to Crete? This one doesn't work. Wouldn't it be nice to speak Latin when you went to Rome? And so Paul, as he went to these different places, God gave him the gift of tongues as he evangelized. 
never studied, but he could speak them. I think that's what the gift of tongues was for in Paul's day, as he evangelized, and that was a very useful, it wasn't a useless thing. Just, do you think God ever gives a useless gift that doesn't profit anybody except for you? All God's gifts are for the building up of the church. Oh, every gift that you have, God's given you so that you're a benefit to the local church and to the church at large. Isn't that an amazing thing? And so they had this Greek that everybody spoke. And so uh, let's pretend Tim was a Indian from India, but he was a businessman and he was over in Damascus doing a little bit of business and bringing his spices from India and everybody needed saffron because you can't get saffron other than the Middle East. And so he brings his saffron over and everybody's going, this makes the rice taste so awesome. And they're buying it by the spoonfuls because that's all you can afford with saffron because it's very expensive. Um, and someone tells him the gospel in Greek because he's a businessman. He has to speak Greek. Then he goes back home. Now he's in India and he's in southern India and he speaks Malayalam because that's the only language I ever know. They speak Punjabi too. But, uh. So now he speaks Malayalam and he tells everybody in Kerala that Jesus died for them. But because he was a businessman and knew Greek, and that's what the world was traveling in, when he went back home, he could translate all that into his own language. <coughs> Isn't that a neat thing that God set up in those 400 years? The highway system, the relative stability, so that when you went down the highway, you didn't have to worry about getting left for dead. Um, it fulfills prophecy. When God broke his silence, he was fulfilling prophecy. So when, what year was Jesus supposed to be born? You've heard all those Christmas messages and not one preacher ever told you when Jesus was supposed to be born? Shame on us. There's a prophecy in the Bible that tells us when Jesus is supposed to be born. It doesn't say December 5th, 25th, sorry, the year zero. But it does say in Daniel chapter 9 that Messiah will be cut off after 69 weeks. The Messiah will die after 69 weeks. After 483 years, Messiah is going to die. That sure gives a big hint about when he's going to be born, though, doesn't it? So how long does a person live, Anna? Pretend um, you're in those days. Oh. Pretend you're in Jesus' days and they didn't have respirators and ICU units. <coughs> just guess. Oh, no. I don't know either. I'm just. 100 years? I think that might be a little bit long. Yeah, like 80. Well, even if it's 100 years, we can take 100 years. So if Messiah is going to get cut off at this day, We'd have to imagine he'd have to be born in those last 100 years, right? If your lifespan was only 50 years, it narrows it down. But we can deal with 100 years. That's no problem. That fits in with my argument still. So, <laughs> no, it does. It just says that in this 100 years, if, if the Messiah lived 100 years, he'd have to be born within that 100 years. Right? So between... 100 BC to, well, I guess uh, 68 BC to 32 AD, he'd have to be born. That gives, it's a whole lot better than I have no idea. You got at least a hundred year span where he's supposed to. And so when Daniel makes that prophecy in chapter 9 of Daniel, verse 26, and he says, 
After seven weeks and 62 weeks, Messiah is going to be cut off. So that gives us an idea that he has to be born before he dies, doesn't he? I think so. <coughs> Modern medicine changes sort of things like that, but generally you have to be born before you die. <laughs> I think the Koreans have it right, and they count your birthday apparently from the day of conception. So... You weren't really born on January 11th. You were actually born uh, March 11th or April 11th. April 11th. That's just sort of the nine months of pregnancy. So in Korea, your birthday actually started at your day of conception. And in God's eyes, maybe that happens too. Uh, but that prophecy tells us that Messiah would have to be born in that time period. And in the fullness of time, what would happen if the Messiah came right after the book of Malachi? So there was no 400-year wait. It would have been harder to get the good news out. It would have been harder to get the good news out, but he wouldn't be fulfilling prophecy now, would he? And what's the thing we know about prophecy? It's God showing that he's God. That he's the three O's, remember? Next time you drive by triple O, you think, don't think hamburgers. We think omnipotence, omniscience, all-knowing, and omnipresence. He's everywhere. Because if you're going to prophesy the future, you've got to know it. You've got to be able to make it happen. You have to be all-powerful, and you have to be everywhere because there's going to be somebody trying to stop you. And there's an adversary that God has. His name is the devil. And so prophecy is being fulfilled. Now, it says in the prophecies, remember it says seven weeks and then 62 weeks. What were the seven weeks? About 49 years. The rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem, even in adversity, says uh, Daniel chapter 9. When were the walls supposed to be started? The decree. The decree of Artaxerxes mm -hmm. in the book of Nehemiah chapter 2. Remember Nehemiah asked, uh, the gates are down, my people aren't doing well, the walls are crumbled. He was pretty sad about it. And then there was a decree went forth to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. That's, that's when it started. That's why the 49 years are there, because it took 49 years to get Jerusalem rebuilt again. And then 62 weeks after that brings us to 32 A.D. From 445 B.C. to 32 A.D., is 483 years. So Messiah had to be born in that time period in order to be cut off to die. Now some people say that already happened. The 70 weeks are complete. But it says in Daniel, we should probably look at it, but we don't have much time, but it doesn't matter. We've got all the time in the world and there are no kids waiting for us. But I don't have my glasses. If I stand far enough back, maybe it'll focus, but maybe it won't. I'll read the lines of I think you, Daniel chapter 9. And I think verse 23 or 24 says. Take this to you and your city. Where does it say that, Josh? I can't see it. Um, verse 20, it should be 23 or 24, somewhere in there. Maybe 25. 24. 24. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Okay, so who are Daniel's people? 
Okay, they're not Canadians. They're not Americans. They're not Russians. They're not Chinese. Daniel was a Jew. That's very clear in chapter 1 of Daniel. Okay, and what's Daniel's city name? Jerusalem. It's not New York. It's not Los Angeles. It's not Bombay. It's not Beijing. It's Jerusalem. Okay, don't let anybody fool you and tell you that America is in the scriptures. It's not. The scriptures are about the Jews. It's about Israel. And God using Israel, not as a special people, although they were special, but as a chosen people, to be an example of what life is supposed to be like in a relationship with God. They messed up big time. And so the book of Romans would say that God has set them a time apart now. <coughs> but sorry, continue on, John. So 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Okay, we'll stop there. Um, anybody been transgressed lately? Anybody been sinned against lately? Anybody seen something that's not righteous lately? So it says 70 weeks, and after 70 weeks, there's going to be no more transgression. There's going to be no more sin. Righteousness is going to stand. Is that in the world today? No. Okay, so don't let people fool you and tell you that the 70 weeks happened already. <coughs> because they're, I'm going to use this word, stupid. And you're going to say, why? That's pretty strong. Because they can't see that it says they're going to bring an end to these things. And if they think that this world and Trudeau and Biden and... Harper or anybody is reigning in righteousness, they're blinder than a bat and stupider than a stick. Okay? But it's obvious to everybody. And if you can't see that, why do we have police? Why are there all these videos of police doing things? Why are there jails? Why are there hospitals? Why are there psychiatrists, psychologists, suicide prevention lines? Why are all these things? Why are people still being abused? Why are people still being exploited? Because this hasn't happened yet. There are preachers, there are Bible teachers that want to teach that this happened in 70 AD and it's all over. Well, first of all, they haven't figured out that 32 plus 7 is 39. I don't know what's 32 plus 7. 32 plus 7. You can do that on your fingers. 32, 33, 34, 35, 36. 37, 38. So when they say that when the temple was destroyed in 70, they're doing stupid math because 32 plus 7 is 39. Then they say, well, when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Um, but that's besides it. Well, <laughs> that is the point. Don't let people fool you. God says to love him with all your mind. A lot of people, when they come to religious things, Christian things, they take their brain out, they set it at the door, they go in, they sing, they listen to a sermon, and then when they leave, they put their brain back in. It's supposed to be harmless as doves and wise as serpents. <coughs> We're supposed to be Bereans to examine if these things are true or not. We're supposed to love God with our mind. He asks us to meditate on the word, to contemplate it, to think about it. So don't let people fool you. This, mm -hmm. as, that's not in the world today. This isn't finished. So what we're in is what we call a parenthesis or a bracket. 
between week 69 when Messiah was cut off and whenever this is going to start to happen again. So we're in this sort of, well, it's just like those 400 years, you know, that when a God was apparently silent. We have God's word and, and there are interesting things. I think the next time we go to Bulo and we find out if that cabin's really standing and if it really is standing, it's going to be a display of God's provision and answered prayer. Because apparently it has a whole bunch of fire retardant on it. What color is fire retardant? Red. And the red covering protected the building. I think I'll preach. <laughs> when when Anna's at camp and she smells like smoke and but she's got a smile from ear to ear on me, she's gonna say, Look, girls, see that red cabin? It was saved from the fire because of the red stuff that's on it. And you know what? When you trust in Jesus as your savior, his blood saves you from the wrath and the fire of God. That'll work out there. And if it's still there, that's gonna every kid's gonna know that it ever goes there. It's gonna be completely simplest gospel message that anybody doesn't have to invent. So prophecy. Um the people, what happens when you don't hear from someone for a long time? <laughs> <laughs> but we know that God's not dead. He's surely alive. He's living on the inside, roaring like a lion. Uh, <laughs> but before we think they're dead, before they're AWOL, before they're uh, the unknown soldier, um, <laughs> you might feel forgotten. Um, so you get a shirt that says free hugs on it. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, when, when I was starting to see Leo, uh, my Spanish writing was horrible. Uh, but I caveman my Spanish in the letter because there was no email in those days. And she didn't have a phone. Uh, we actually never talked on the phone until we had been married for a couple of years. It was the first time I ever talked to my wife on the phone. Um, but you, you miss them. And you sort of have an expectancy that you'd sure like to hear from. Them. When Jesus was born, were there any people that were just like so thrilled and so elated that they said, Take me home, Lord. I've seen the consummation of Israel. Was there anybody like that? Mm -hmm. Somebody has the same name as you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was just, you know, God in Amos says, I'm going to send uh, a, a, a hunger. Not a hunger. What is it? Yeah, a hunger. That's not what he said. What did he say in English? I'm going to send a famine. That's what he said. But not a famine for bread and water, for food. But I'm going to send a famine, a hunger for the word of God. So Simeon's there. Heard of God. God heard my prayer. He was right before Anna, wasn't he? In Luke chapter 2. He was just. What about those shepherds? Do you think they were pretty happy? <laughs> now. They might have. Followed the angel. And the angel you know, gets to fly. So you might have to run after the angel. But the angel didn't take them back to the field. How do you think they went back to the field? This is just pure speculation. And they won. You think they walked? Hey, come on, yes, Marcus. This is worse than <laughs> stone. You no, know, paper. He wrote them in a book. That's what you say. 
Okay, for me, when I think of uh, when I think about happy, uh, I think of Danny, like like little Danny. Uh, <laughs> oh, he's Danny. <laughs> Sorry, Danny. <laughs> but but because he's my neighbor, I see him about every day. And you know, Danny doesn't know how to run properly. You probably don't know that. You see him go pretty good. But if you ever see Danny run, he's running, and then he throws in a skip or two, and then he keeps running. Have you ever watched Danny, and you'll see him. He'll be running for like 20 yards, and then going to skip, and then he'll keep running again. It's That's how I imagine the shepherds going home, skipping. We got to. We got to see something that nobody, we've been waiting 400 years for this. It's awesome. And that's how I imagine that, that they were skipping home. That they were, uh, well, they didn't have Michael Jackson in those days, but they may have been moonwalking. How do you glide home when your feet are six feet off the ground, or six inches off the ground, and your feet don't touch? So if you ask uh, <coughs> Pat Johnson, uh, Denise Gorman's mom, uh, we, were at, we were at your mother-in-law's and father-in-law's wedding, and she was sitting at our table, and, and she had us laughing so hard that my stomach was so. So she was telling these stories about how Milt uh, would get out of his car and sort of glide up the sidewalk to the door. He never walked, his feet never touched the ground. They were so in love that. And that's, this is Pat telling the story about her daughter's boyfriend and soon to be husband and how he just sort of floated. He was so happy. Just worked 14 hours at the mill uh, doing his job, and he wasn't hungry, he wasn't tired. He was going to visit Denise. Zoom, and he just flowed in on the wings of an eagle. And uh, that's how I imagine these. Imagine God just did something that if you were told it beforehand, you wouldn't believe it. Says that in, in the Old Testament, says in the New Testament too, about the resurrection. I'm going to do something so great amongst you that if you were to see it, if you're told it beforehand, you'd say, That's the stupidest thing I ever heard. But when you see it, you're going to go away floating six inches off the ground because it's going to affect you so hard. It's going to affect you so much that you're just going to go away rejoicing. There's no other option. What do you think the shepherds felt like? Marcus, after hearing that, you don't honestly think they walked home. <laughs> oh, we just saw the Messiah being born. They're joyful. I think they were pretty happy. I don't even know if joyful is the, the right word to use. Um, what about the Magi? Why were they there in the first place? bring who? Did they know who he was? No. Did he go up, you know, hey, King Herod, where's Jesus? Is that what they said? No. What did the Magi say? Where is the King of the Jews? Where is he who is born King of the Jews? Where did they come from? Far away land. Far away land. Jeez, they probably came from Babylon. Babylon was, despite it being an ancient culture, um, how many seconds are in a minute? 60. How many minutes are in an hour? 60. Why are there 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour? Because of the Babylonians. Time was in, well, time always existed. Uh, but the Babylonians invented the watch. Well, maybe they didn't, but you know what I mean. They figured this six and sixty and three hundred sixty days in a year is a prophetical year. These have big stuff, and they came from 
ancient stupid Babylon. Oh, maybe they weren't so stupid after all. We're still using these things 3,000 years later. Mr. Rolex seemed to think it worked pretty well. Mr. Bolova seemed to think it worked pretty well. Um, the Magi came. When did they leave? When did they begin their journey? When they saw the star. When did, is there anything in the Bible that says that they were like, were they following the word of God? Were they from the they see a star? Like, is there anything in the Old Testament that would direct them to? Well, I think I'm forgetting where in Daniel, but uh, if I had my glasses, that'd be much better. But I think in the book of Daniel, it mentions it. No, it's the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 61. That sounds pretty confident. <laughs> 18,950. <laughs> See, this is the problem with Marcus. He gives brilliant answers sometimes, and then he says they walked home. <laughs> he wrote it. The Ten Commandments were written in a book. <laughs> so now we've got a fact check. If you knew 18,910. <laughs> but I thought it was in Daniel. But, I, but they were following a star for some reason. And they were following a star with the understanding that they were looking for he who was born king of the Jews. Now, I'm not exactly, it's about 800 K, no, 800 miles from Jerusalem to Babylon. Because you have to go up and over and follow the Euphrates down because you just can't come across that desert. There's no water, you're going to die. So you've got to take this 800 mile route. I don't know how fast a camel goes. The camels I see, they're sort of lumbering along. They don't look like they're going any more than maybe two or three miles an hour. Uh, they might have been traveling for a year before they got there. Do you think they were going to see something that they weren't going with expectancy and, and a hunger to see that? It says in Isaiah 60, which I was... One chapter off, and they didn't have chapters. And when Isaiah wrote the book, what does it say? It says, uh, where are we here? Isaiah 60. Gold. Oh, yeah. They shall bring golden incense. So they're offering, offering worship. But where was it say they're following a star? That was Josh's question. Anyway. I'll find it when I get my glasses. But at any rate, they could have, let's just say they, they took them six months to get there. Maybe it took them a whole year. Would you go travel for six months to get to something that you didn't have a hope to see something brilliant? Something awesome? You see, this hunger, this famine that God gave to the people, not for food, but for the Word of God. And who is the Word of God incarnate? The Lord Jesus. And you see, they weren't just traveling to give away, well, I got some gold, and I got some incense, and I got some myrrh, and I need to give it to somebody, so I'll travel 800 miles to give it away. They weren't going to do that. They could have given it away in their own hometown. You see, they went with this expectance. And so when the New Testament opens and we see these things happening, we see that that 400 years did something. And people were waiting for the consummation of Israel. They were waiting to see the Savior. And when they saw him, they rejoiced. And they were saying, you know, that's nothing's going to get better than this. I'm ready to die. This is like the best thing that ever happened. And that's what God was doing in those 400 signs a year. Now, he's been quiet for about 2,000 years now. 
five times as long. What's he doing in your life? When, when you came to the discipleship program this summer, did you come to with expectancy to hear from God? Annika told me after the first message, that's exactly what I needed to hear. There was dealing with some things in her life and some decisions that she made concerning the future. And, and she said, that's, that's exactly what I needed to hear. I came and I wanted to hear from God. And he said something. Is, are we still here to hear from God? When we go to Sunday morning meeting, our, we got Trevor again. I've been listening to that guy all week long. God have mercy on us, please. And he gets laryngitis or something that like Magnus is sharing. I just can't take this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> He's got like. You ask Tim, you ask anybody that preaches, Josh, he's got a good voice to listen to. Got that good deal. <laughs> now, he could be like that James Earl Jones guy. <laughs> be Darth Vader. I would like to listen to that voice rather than my voice. <laughs> <laughs> you wait, don't laugh at him. He's got a brilliant voice. And if he studies his Bible and becomes a preacher, there's, there's this guy named Alexander Scorby. Scorby, thanks. When you listen to him read the Bible, you don't need him to preach. It's it's just like that's the most wonderful thing to listen to. And there's you don't have to James Earl Jones does the New Testament, he doesn't do the Old Testament, but it's just I don't need to listen to any preacher. I just listen to God's word. And he's speaking to me through. So when you, when you go to Sunday meeting, when you go to Sunday school, when you come to these classes, I hope you're not coming to hear from me. But you have that expectancy that God can use the foolish things of the world. And he's going to teach me something in God can make rocks cry out. You put a rock in front. Man, let him speak. You see, do we have that expectancy like Anna did, like Simeon did, like the Magi did, like the shepherds did? And when we're done, we go home rejoicing. Oh. Tell a story about Annika's dad, uh, Andreas. Some of you know him. Uh, he's a pretty observant guy, and he notices things. And there was a, when he used to go to 16th. There's this lady there, and, and Jesse knows her. Her name's Jill Delaney. Now, whenever you talk to Jill after the meeting, she always goes, "Wasn't like that." Best sermon you ever heard? It didn't matter if it was me speaking or Jade Nicholson speaking. It didn't matter. She thought that she was there and God used whoever was speaking to speak to her. And every Sunday, every Tuesday night, she says, wasn't that the best thing you ever heard? She always says that. <coughs> and it's, it's quite amazing. And you think, you know, she didn't go there to hear Jade. She went to go and wanted to hear from God. And, and uh, one time Andreas said, you know, she's never heard a bad sermon ever. <laughs> and it's absolutely right, because she never ever went to hear the preacher. She always went to hear from God. And while we're here, guys, let's listen for God's voice. As he whispers things in our ears as we're praying through this sort of strange time, uh, God's brought us here for such a time as this. And we may have come to do it at camp. But right now we're praying on whether we should 
to bring camp to KBC. We can do it. In Mexico, we used to have six, seven, eight hundred kids come to the chapel. And we'd have one side singing Allelu, 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 Alleluia, and the other side singing Praise Ye the Lord. And it was like a thunderous earthquake. And boy, if I could get those videos off my old computer, that would be awesome. You could see this one little kid. <laughs> and at the end, he's lying on the ground, screaming, trying to win the competition. <laughs> you and I are here for such a time as this. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. God wants to do something, whether it's here in these messages or if we're going to help somebody who needs a little bit of help, one of the neighbors or one of the saints from the assembly, uh, we're here because God has us here. And uh, we would hate to disappoint him when he has us here for such a time as this. Father, we've been thinking about those words of Mordecai to Esther. I suppose a little bit of of Paul writing to the Galatians, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a virgin, born of a woman, sorry, born under the law. When everything was set, when it appeared that you weren't listening, when it appeared that you weren't doing something, there were those people who had grown hungry for you, who had grown thirsty for you. And you revealed yourself to them, and they, they all went away rejoicing. And our prayer is, Father, that as we go through this week, that you would guide our footsteps, that you would guide our thoughts and our thinking, and you would encourage us in some way, somehow, you would be speaking to our hearts, you would be speaking to our souls, that we would know your presence despite your silence or apparent silence. Though others might not be listening, Father, our prayer is that we would hear your voice working and speaking to us. We would see your hand guiding and leading and holding. And as we wait upon you, our prayer is that you would mount us up as on the wings of eagles and help us soar for the glory and the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.